Good evening and welcome to Next on the Tee with Chris Mascaro, where PGA and LPGA players, legends, and top instructors go to share their insights and playing lessons. Join Chris every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time as he talks with the greats of the game. Tonight's show is sponsored by the French Lick Resort, Ben Hogan Golf, the PGA Tour Superstore, the Salt Creek Golf Retreat, TaylorMade Golf, the Bobby Jones Apparel Company, and Super Speed Golf. Now here's your host, Chris Mascaro. Good evening, folks, and welcome to Next on the Tee. I'm your host, Chris Mascaro, and boy, I hope your week is going really well, and you're soaking in this wonderful holiday time of year. We've got Christmas songs playing all over the radio, Christmas specials and movies on TV, people hanging up their lights and their trees and all the beautiful scenery you get to see now when you're driving home at night. It's absolutely my favorite time of the year. So whether you celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa or Festivus for the rest of us, I hope you really enjoy it and get the uh, opportunity to spend it with some family and friends. Tonight here on the show, we get to spend the next hour with two amazing individuals. My first guest is going to be LPGA pro Natalie Sheary. Natalie was a fantastic player in college at Wake Forest. She won the ACC Women's Championship back in 2009. She won the 2016 WB Mason Championship out on the Symmetra Tour. And this past year, she had three top 10 finishes out on that tour. So we're going to talk about all of that. We'll talk about Life out on the Symmetra Tour and the nearly 30,000 miles that Natalie drives every year in her car going from tournament to tournament. So what's the grind like? What's it like to be out there on the tour? So, sort of the non-glamorous stuff that we don't really get to see and uh, they have to deal with and put up with and get through. But then, you know, also play really good golf and, and uh, live and glamorous on the Symmetra Tour, folks. I know Natalie's got some things that she does in the off season to try to raise money for going back out on the tour the next year. So we'll talk about all of that. And and she's a wonderfully positive individual. Go check out her Twitter page, at Nat Sherry, S-H-E-A-R-Y, Nat Sherry, out on Twitter. Wonderful stuff. So we'll talk about all of those things, her goals for 2019, and, and a lot more when she joins me here in just a few minutes. Following her, I'll be joined by former president of the PGA of America, Paul Levy. Paul's two-year term as president just finished up. Last month, he was named an honorary president of the PGA, Paul played his college golf at LSU back in the early 1980s, along with our friend Bob Friend Jr. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about some of the things facing the PGA in 2019, like moving the PGA Championship to May. We'll hear how they decide which venues to award the PGA and Senior PGA and Senior LPGA and the LPGA Championships to. We'll talk about some of the fun things he's gotten to do that maybe a young Paul Levy never would have dreamed he would have had the opportunity to do. Plus, on the opposite side, what were some of the things that came along with being president of the PGA that weren't really in the job description? So a lot to get into with Paul when he joins me a little bit later on in this half hour. So a lot more great stories and information coming your way tonight on this edition of Next on the Tee. Thank you so much for tuning in and taking the journey with me tonight. But before we get started, like we always do, I'd like to remind you about our good friend Mitch Lawrence and his podcast, Talking Golf Getaways. He and his co-host, Darren Bunch, they let you know about great places to stay, play, and even eat and drink while you're there. Again, their show is called Talking Golf Getaways, and you can stream it on golfnewsnet.com or over on Audio Boom or pretty much anywhere you can consume podcasts. His twin brother, Matthew, also has a great show called Backspin Golf, which is on hiatus for a couple of months, which you guys know is driving me nuts. Matthew's show typically airs on ESPN Radio AM 1300 up in Lexington, Kentucky, on Sunday mornings from 8 to 9 a.m. Eastern Time. But I encourage you to still go online to WLXG.com to check out their archive shows as a podcast, because really the show is just fantastic, and so is Matthew. Again, the the show is called Backspin Golf, and you can stream this season's shows as a podcast online at WLXG.com or on the WLXG app. And folks, as you know, we are sponsored by the French Lick Resort. Let's hear a word from Steve Rondonero about what they've got going on up there. Play legendary golf at French Lick Resort, the only place in the country where you can play courses by two Hall of Fame designers on the same property. Our Pete Dye and Donald Ross courses offer two very different challenges. Experience them both and save with our Hall of Fame package. Our two historic hotels are unique as well. Cap it off with a fun visit to the French Lick Casino. 
Check us out online at FrenchLick.com. Bring a group and save even more. Play legendary golf this season at French Lick Resort. Yeah, folks, be sure to go online to FrenchLick.com to see for, see for yourself what a wonderful place they've got up there. And it is so beautiful this time of year with all the Christmas lights and decorations. They just had the Christmas tree lighting ceremony this past weekend up there. Go online to FrenchLick.com to see for yourself what a wonderful place and to book your stay as well. also want to tell you about our good friends at the Ben Hogan Golf Equipment Company. Now, folks, if you haven't hit Ben Hogan Iron since maybe the 80s or the 90s, do yourself a favor and go online and get a demo iron from either their Fort Worth, PTX, or New Edge irons. And go on the range and compare them to whatever it is you have. All Ben Hogan irons and wedges are handcrafted one at a time in their Fort Worth, Texas factory. No mass production, no shortcuts. Now you can order custom-made irons, wedges, and hybrids by going online to BenHoganGolf.com. And they're going to build those clubs to your specifications. And best of all, charge you a fraction of the typical retail price. Check out their complete line of forged irons, wedges, utility irons, hybrids, bags, and accessories by going online to BenHoganGolf.com. Please also check out our friends at the Bobby Jones Apparel Company by going online to BobbyJones.com. Their holiday collection is out. A tribute to golf's Bobby Jones, the golf great Bobby Jones, and the films that he made with some of the biggest stars from the early 1930s are now showing up in their sportswear. It's resulting in a renewal of the authentic sportswear for many of the roles that we all play in life. See it online for yourself by going to bobbyjones.com. All right, now joining me here on the French Lick Resort guest line is Sir Metro Tour Pro Natalie Sheary. Let me give you some background on Natalie she is from West Hartford, Connecticut, played her college golf at Wake Forest, where she was named the 2007 ACC Freshman of the Year for Women's Golf. In 2008, she was named the ACC Rookie of the Year and a Top 50 Female Golfer to Watch by Golf Week Magazine. 2009, she won the ACC Women's Golf Championship and was named their Player of the Year. She won the 2010 Connecticut Women's Open and was a medalist at the LPGA Futures Tour Q School. 2011, Golf Week named her a third-team All-American, and she was the recipient of the Ed Wilson Award for Academic Excellence. She finished eighth that season in the NCAA Championship, and she ended her college career with a 74.47 scoring average, which is the lowest in Wake Forest history. She joined the Symmetra Tour back in 2012. She won the 2016 WB Mason Championship at Thorny Lee Golf Club up in Brockton, Massachusetts. She had another strong year here in 2018, highlighted by three top 10 finishes, and I'm very excited she's with me tonight here on Next on the Tee. Good evening, Natalie. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. So, Natalie, I, I, I kind of want to go back to your younger years, and I read that you started playing golf at the age of 12, and by 17, you were packing up and leaving Connecticut to go live in Florida by yourself, oh, by the way, to attend the Ledbetter School of Golf. So, Let's start there. How do you go from picking up a club at 12 to being that good at 17? Because most of us are just going from awful to bad in five years. <laughs> you know, I was so lucky. My dad actually surprised me with a golf lesson for my 12th birthday. And I think that was like the smartest thing that he could have done because I think there's so many dads out there who try to teach. And he got me instruction right away. Um, he did enjoy golf playing with his friends. But, uh, you know, so he knew the game, but he decided to have me have my first golf lesson as my first time ever playing, and I loved it ever since. Practiced all the time, obviously, with my parents helping me out, driving me to and from practice. Uh, I did grow up in the Northeast, being from Hartford, Connecticut, so our season is quite short, but um, I was able to go to a place called Golfer's Warehouse, which is basically a huge dick sort of business for golf. They have a bunch of petting days, a large practice green where they sold all their putters. And every day after school, when it was winter, when all the courses were closed, my dad or my mom would bring me down there and I'd hit balls into a net for several hours and I'd putt forever. And I just worked on my game that way because I felt like I started when I was 12. Most kids started earlier, especially in junior golf when I was meeting people all the time. You know, they started four, five, six, seven years old. And they all lived in warm climates, Florida, California, Arizona. So they were practicing all the time. So I felt like at least outwork them, at least I'd have a chance to beat them. So that's what I did. And Natalie, talk about the decision to leave home and high school to move down to Florida, again, alone to attend the Ledbetter School. It had to be a really hard decision to make. You know, actually, um, 
it wasn't it not too hard only because I loved the game so much. I knew I was going to Wake Forest at that point. Um, I knew that, you know, Wake being in North Carolina, the weather was going to be better. I was going to have the opportunity to play all year, and I had never had that before living in the Northeast. So I thought that Florida would be a great transition of, you know, weather, practicing with other people, learning to be part of a team that would get me ready for my Wake Forest years. So once I had the opportunity, I was offered a scholarship to go to the Ledbetter Golf Academy at IMG Academies in Bradenton. Um, I was so excited. I definitely, you know, took them up on it. So how did you already know at that point that you were going to go to Wake Forest? Why Wake? You know, I looked at several schools. I printed out. Obviously, I played AJGA growing up. Um, you need to get your name out there. The American Junior Golf Association does a great job hosting some of the top, you know, tournaments in the world. You've got so many international players. But um, I actually went on to Golf Week at the time, printed out the the Golf Week rankings for colleges. I specifically looked at top 10, and then I looked at location, academic. Obviously, they were all good golf schools. So I did look at Duke. I looked at UVA, Wake Forest, obviously, and I looked at a few others. And once I visited the schools by playing tournaments nearby, I just knew that Wake was the place for me, and I absolutely loved it. And when you look at the rich history that Wake Forest has in golf, some tremendous golf alumni, starting with the King Arnold Palmer and You've got so many legends like Curtis Strange and Lanny Watkins, Webb Simpson, Adams, who are now went to Wake. The list could go on and on and on. Laura Diaz on the women's side. So did any of those you know, guys or gals come back and spend some time with you guys to give you an opportunity to not only pick their brains, but uh, maybe share a tip or two or share their experiences from transitioning from college golf out onto the pro tour? Sure. You know, actually, my freshman year, Webb Simpson was still there. He was a senior. So I got to see him practice all the time, which was really cool. And at, I mean, at that point, he was, you know, the top college player. So I knew that he'd go on to great things. So just being able to be in school with him, Laura Diaz, once I made it to LPGA, was really helpful in my transition from college golf and semester tour out onto LPGA because she was still playing as well. To be able to go to Wake Forest and single teammate that I had for the four years, so we got like 10, 15, 20, you know, girls. Every single one of them turned professional. So all of us were practicing hard. All of us had dreams to play after college. So it was really great that once I graduated, the girls who I had played golf with were also out on tour. So there was a lot of love and support happening out there as well from them. And one of your teammates while you are there was Cheyenne Woods, right? Cheyenne Woods was there for three out of my four years. She was one year younger than I am. Yes. So what was it like getting to team with her? It was really, really cool. Obviously, she won ACC's one year, just having so much notoriety with her there. She loved the school as well, just to see her practice and see how much she enjoyed being there, even though she did get opportunities. You know, growing up, obviously being associated with Tiger, being a family member, you know, she didn't have to stay in school for four years. She had opportunities. She had sponsors' exemptions to go play. It would have been easy for her to leave, but she chose to stay, and I think that's you know, speaks a lot about her and how much she values school and Wake Forest and how much she had a great time. So you know, she really couldn't be a better person. Um, it was a great, great three years that I got to spend with her as a teammate. So now when I look at the, the ladies' college golf rankings, you got Wake still in the top 15. So how much do you still keep track of how well they're doing and where they are? Yes, you know, we, I have been keeping track. Um, obviously I had coached daily. Um, she was there for 30 years. She just retired this past spring, um, after one of our players, um, won the NCAA championship, um, you know, individually. And actually the UVA coach who was there when I was playing at Wake Forest, she actually transitioned. She's the Wake Forest coach now. So. There's been a few changes with the program, but they're still playing really well. Still a very strong schedule, so I have been keeping track, of course. It's always go deep. <laughs> Indeed. So, Natalie, you're you're out on the Symmetra Tour for a few years, and then you break through at the 2016 WB Mason Championship. You get your first win. Not all that far from home, so what was that win like for you? You know, that was super cool because my dad on back. So to have him by my side and to have my mom watching and to have some, you know, really close friends and neighbors be able to come up, because it was only about an hour and a half from the house, uh, was something truly special. I mean, that was an awesome day. 
And looking back at this season out on the tour, you had three top ten finishes. So give us give us kind of a report card. How do you feel about the state of your game and the results you were able to get this past season? Yeah, you know, I've been ball. My ball striking has been so solid. I actually finished 2017 and 2018 as the number one in greens and regulation and driving accuracy. Um, so obviously I know that my, my long game is strong and I have to thank, you know, my coach Andy O'Brien out of, uh, Windermere, Florida. I switched to him just a few years ago and we've made some, some awesome changes that obviously are, are showing out there. But I mean, on any level, you know what it is. It's all about making putts. And I actually spend most of my time on putting my weakest point stat wise. So that's always something that I'm trying to grind up. Obviously, I need to make more putts. So, Natalie, looking ahead yeah, to, to 2019, do you have specific goals that you set for yourself? I always have fitness. I, I always have goals. I always have nutrition goals. I always have fitness goals. I think that you can always feel better, look better, perform better. Um, and, you know, I've really tried to listen to my body and just make sure that it has what it needs in order to do everything that I want it to do. Obviously, we have a long season. There's a lot of a lot of things involved, whether it's playing six, seven weeks in a row or driving several hours from event to event, you know, you just need to make sure that you're taking care of your body so that it takes care of you. But um, as far as, you know, my game, my coach and I have some things that we're working on in my swing just to kind of tighten a few things up. I don't think that we're far off. But again, it's all about putting right now. So now you talk about your daily routine. What's it like now? As, as you were mentioning a little bit ago, here we are, we're getting into, you know, the winter season. Talk about what daily life and daily routine is like for you right now? Sure. In order to work with my coach, I have a strength trainer in town. So in my last few years, I went back to IMG Academy to train during the winter. And then I bounced around a little bit in Florida until I went to Orlando. And I've spent the last three and a half seasons in Orlando because of Andy O'Brien, my strength coach in Windermere. And then I also have my strength coach, um, his name is T.A., and he has a great gym centrally located in Orlando that I see. I try to go at least five times a week, but um, between practice, working out, and I also work at, actually as a caddy. Um, I work at the Ritz-Carlton, and I work at Bay Hill, which is an Arnold Palmer golf course. Wow. But, um, it, you know, my days are super, super, super busy, So, and that's the way that I like it. I like to use my 24 hours as much as I can, as I, productive as I can, so... Um, even though I had to relocate down here, obviously, just to get out of the cold weather so that I can keep practicing, um, I feel like I'm using my time pretty wisely down here. Wow. So getting to caddy at Bay Hill, talk about what that's like. And do you get the opportunity then at the end of the day or the different times when you're not uh, on schedule to go out and play? Yeah, you know, I have not played there yet just because they've been, they've been so busy, which is great to see. Uh, I think, you know, we have a ton of people who want to play before the guys come in for the R. Palmer uh, Invitational, the API. But like tomorrow's schedule, I am doing a double bag loop at 7.50, so I need to be there at 6.50. I will probably finish around noon because at, at Bay Hill, they want you to play in about four, four hours and ten minutes. And then I will drive just a few miles down the road to Grand Vista and Marriott Practice Facility, and I'll practice there pretty much from 12.30 to dark and wow. try to get a workout in right after that. So, N- Natalie, take that a step further. Talk about life on the Symmetra Tour. I saw on your Twitter page where you're logging about 29,000 miles a year in your car. Yeah. So, our, yeah. you know, talk about the grind of the traveling and all of that sort of thing, you know, then – you got the practice and, and then the tournaments and the pro-ams and life isn't always as glamorous as we probably picture that it is out on tour. Right. I think people most think that we take our, you know, private planes, we stay at the, you know, four star hotels and we get, you know, shuttles everywhere or the courtesy cars and, you know, maybe some LPJ players get that, but not all and definitely not some Metro Tour players. Um, actually, when I leave Orlando about mid-March, I don't return until October. So everything that I need from March until October needs to come with me. And obviously, we play all over the U.S. We have all different kind of, you know, weather conditions, hot, cold, whatever, all the extra golf balls, gloves, extra clubs, shoes. Everything needs to go with me. So all of our cars are extremely packed. They're like our little U-Haul trucks. So when people say that tour players live out of their cars, like, that's exactly what it is. 
And every single week is totally structured. Monday is usually a travel day. Um, Tuesday is a free-for-all practice with a Meet the Pros party every Tuesday. And those are for girls who are in the Pro-Am to kind of go and meet the sponsors, thank everybody for putting on the event. So Wednesday is a Pro-Am, and either Thursday we start or Friday we start. And if it is a Friday start, then usually Thursday there is a Pro-Am as well. And then all of a sudden it's tournament and days. Fridays, at least Friday, Saturday, Sunday we're playing, and sometimes there's a Thursday mixed in as well for our four-day event. So how tough is the mental grind, right, of, of doing all of that, sitting, you know, in the car for however many miles it is between events and then, you know, trying to get in the gym and then trying to get out on the practice range and all of that sort of thing. How do you keep your mind in a positive state? Because when I look at your Twitter page, it's all about positivity. <laughs> Thank you. You know, you have to stay positive out there. I feel like we live a life that it can be stressful, but at the end of the day, you have to look back and be like, you know what? You know how many people would love to work outside? and set their own schedule every single day and be able to go to the gym, you know, when they want and meet all these great people nationwide. Like, you know, we really live a blessed life, and I feel like you need to look at it like that in order to see it. Um, If I need to drive a little bit to get, you know, from each event to each event, then I'll do it. You know, if it means having all my stuff with me and not flying and not having to have a rental car, that's no problem. Um I am, I do try to sign up for as many host families as possible because I'm very big into nutrition and meal prepping. And if I can stay at someone who's associated with, you know, the golf course charity, if I can stay with them and be able to make my own meals and just be able to come home and just have some people to speak with rather than going to a hotel room and having it be super quiet, I feel like that also helps relax and calm down and, you know, keep things really positive. And Natalie, talking about staying on the sort of like the mental side of the game, talk about dealing with sort of the ups and downs. You know, you have a good tournament, you're up. You have a not so good tournament, you're down. How do you not get too down on yourself if you've had a bad tournament? And and like my father says, don't read uh, your press clippings too much when you've had a really good one. Yes. Um, you know, I mean, for anybody who plays golf, they know, like, golf, that is golf. There's going to be days when you show up where everything feels really, really good and you just feel, feel like you can't miss and the hole just seems so big. And then there's, there's maybe, you know, some other days, maybe it's even the next day that you show up and, you know, the swing is a little bit off. Your kind of tempo is a little bit off. Maybe you're kind of quick that day. You know, the putter's not super hot. As long as you just, I work really hard, so I feel like every day I show up, I know that I am prepped and ready to go. And I just, it's just about kind of, you know, relaxing out there. Maybe it's chatting, with, you know, with my caddy, you know, chatting with the other players in my group. But just knowing that I'm prepped and ready and knowing that I'm going to make mistakes and everybody else is going to make mistakes, as long as I keep positive and kind of forget that shot, that's the only way that you can really play. I mean, you hear people all the time saying one shot at a time. That statement couldn't be any more true. You know, just because I hit a poor shot doesn't mean that I'm going to do it twice. I am going to do it twice if I start thinking about it and thinking why it happened and, you know, what's going on. But if I just think positive thoughts and think like, you know what, okay, I hit that drive bad, but let's see what we can do here. That's what it, that's what it's all about. It's all about grinding. It's all about, you know, seeing what you can do because there are no pictures on the scorecard. And to that end, What role does the caddy play in keeping your mind focused and not allowing you to get too down or get too concerned about a wayward shot or a missed putt? Yes. um, You know, being able to just chat with them, I feel like you're out there for four and a half, five hours. You can't focus that whole time. You, You know, no one can. You have to just focus when you hit that shot. And then while you're walking up the fairway or walking to the green, you have to be able to shut that off real quick. Maybe just, you know, have a quick, you know, conversation with your buddies. For me, it would be my caddy or the other players in my group, like I had mentioned, just to, like, relax and unwind and then get ready for, you know, for the next shot. If if you're tense walking down on the fairway, worrying about whether your ball creeped into the rough or worried about what kind of lie you have in the bunker, I mean, that's no way to play. It's just, you know, it's way too stressful. Golf is such a beautiful sport, and, you know, just being outside, just enjoy the day. And I think that having a caddy or having – I take a lot of local caddies, so for me, it's either hanging out with them because I see them once a year, or maybe I have somebody new and it's trying to get to know them and making sure that they feel comfortable out there. Uh, That's what it's all about. Natalie, just a couple more before we let you go. And 
And I was looking at your Twitter page and I came across one of your tweets that I absolutely love. You wrote, I may not be a Victoria's Secret model, but I could pick one up and squat her. I think that's absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Where did that come from? Thank you. Thank you. I feel like, you know, and especially in this day and age, like obviously sex sales and there's so many girl golfers out there, so many fan pages out there of girls maybe not wearing a lot of clothing and you know they're getting sponsorship deals they're getting spot you know invites everywhere and it's totally cool for them um you know obviously if that's their their calling then great um but i feel like maybe you can't forget about the other people too who maybe don't always look the part or you know work out and lift like girls can be strong too Natalie, let our listeners know, how can they stay up to date with all the great things you're doing and follow you, whether it's online or it's on social media? Yeah, social media for sure. Um, I'm actually the most active on Instagram, and that's also at Nat Sherry, the at sign, N-A-T-S-H-E-A-R-Y. Um, I try to post something either on my story for Day in the Life or, you know, on my page. Obviously, I do tweet. Uh, Facebook, I'm up there as well, but... You know, with this day and age in social media, it's not hard to find us. You can always, if you have, you know, any questions or anything like that, very easy to get a hold of. Well, Natalie, it's been fantastic having you as part of the show tonight. I hope you'll come back and join me again sometime. Share more of your stories and your insights. Talk about what's going on with you because I've really enjoyed having you here tonight. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate it. And I, I would love to be back. Thank you again. Take care, Natalie. Happy holidays to you and your family. I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Yes, happy holidays. Thank you, Chris. Take care, Natalie. That is Natalie Sheary, again, at Nat Sheary, S-H-E-A-R-Y. She's fantastic. And I'll tell you, folks, you know, you look at somebody that is, you know, had a great college career, you know, took a little time to get acclimated out there on the Symmetra Tour, but then gets breaks through with a win in 2016. You know, as she mentioned, number one in, in driving and greens and regulation the last couple of years, three top ten finishes this year. Boy, it just seems like she's just got everything going for her. She's got a great attitude. She's got certainly got the game, as she's mentioned, talking about, you know, focusing on putting. And how many times have, have we had people on this show from, from Gary Player to Tom Patry to all the other, you know, top instructors in the game? Short game, short game, short game. Sounds like she's, you know, focused on all of the right things and doing the right things. I, I expect great things from her. Looking forward to having her back on the show and certainly following her through the 2019 golf season. All right, before I get to my next guest, I want to give a shout out to a few of our sponsors. First, I want to talk about our friends over at Super Speed Golf. Now used by over half of the tour players around the world, Super Speed Golf is the fastest and most effective way to increase your swing speed. Three eight-minute training sessions per week, all you need to see a 5% increase in your swing speed. And now with sets for golfers of all ages and over one year of included video instruction, Super Speed offers a complete solution to help you start bombing it off the tee. Visit them online at superspeedgolf.com to pick up your set today. I also want to remind you about my M4 driver from TaylorMade Golf. Folks, if you haven't tried their twist face technology, you're missing out. I don't know about you, but I don't hit it in the center of the face every single time. So after studying hundreds of thousands of swings from pros and amateurs like us, TaylorMade designed their new drivers to protect us from our miss hits and give us straighter distance. So whether your miss hit is on the low heel or the high toe, Twist Face helps bring the ball back to center, keeping the distance we want and finding the fairway more often. I'm hitting more fairways than I ever have, and the new drivers are the choice of some pretty good golfers you might recognize. Twist Face is played by Tiger Woods, Roy McIlroy, Dustin Johnson, Jason Day, John Rahm, and Justin Rose, to name just a few, and it's dominating the top 10 out on tour. So if you haven't tried Twist Face, go hit it and get fit. It's in the new M3 and M4 drivers and only from TaylorMade Golf. And folks, this segment of the show is sponsored by our friends over at the PGA Tour Superstore. This segment of the show is brought to you by the PGA Tour Superstore. See why golfers everywhere are proud to call PGA Tour Superstore their golf pro shop. Visit them online at PGATourSuperstore.com. Now back to Chris and more of the show. Now joining me on the French Lick Resort guest line is the former president and now honorary president of the PGA of America, Paul Levy. Let me give you some additional background on Paul. He's from New Orleans and played his college golf at LSU. He became a member of the PGA of America back in 1986. From 1999 to 2004, he served as general manager and PGA director of golf at Royal Oaks Country Club in Houston. From 2007 to 2012, Paul was elected as the independent director 
of the Southern California PGA Board of Directors. 2004, he moved to Southern California to oversee the development of Toscana Country Club. He became the CEO and general manager of Toscana Country Club, which is out in Indian Wells, California. He has been the secretary, vice president, and until recently, the president of the PGA of America. He was named president during the centennial year back in 2016. Last month, after serving a two-year term as president, he was named honorary president of the PGA, and I'm honored to have him with me tonight here on Next on the Tee. Good evening, Paul. Thanks for coming on the show. Chris, how are you? I'm fantastic, Chris, Paul. How are you? I sure can. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me as your guest. I appreciate you. So, Paul, as a kid from New Orleans, was playing your college golf anywhere but LSU ever in the discussion? Well, you know, if you grow up in Louisiana, LSU has a pretty strong, uh, strong running in the blood of Louisiana people. And I actually had a scholarship to a junior college in Texas and then had a chance to go to a couple other schools, but I really missed being back in Louisiana where everyone I knew was. And so got to go back to LSU and then graduated. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, LSU is kind of a, a neat place. It's a great school, great, uh, history for not just golf, but all sports. And, uh, you know, I, I am so happy that I was able to spend four years at, at, in Baton Rouge. It's just a great university. So we'll talk about your time playing golf there at LSU. Our good friend Bob Friend Jr. was also there in the early 1980s. So what do you remember about being a part of the team and being there in that, at that time? Well, Bob was a really good player. He was the, my fifth year coming in as a freshman. He came in with Emlyn Aubrey who also uh, was from the Pennsylvania area. And Emlyn played the tour for a while. And then now I think Emlyn's a, a club professional in Shreveport. You know, I was on the team, uh, wasn't one of the top three or four guys on the team. It was a great experience just being a part of the team and playing golf. We had some unbelievable players. My first two years, our captain was Wayne DeFrancisco, who was a first-team All-American. And the second year, we had John Salamone, who was a second-team All-American. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of cool because when Smiley Kaufman got married back in April, his dad, Jeff, was on the team with me and a bunch of us when I was there. And we had a little reunion at Smiley's wedding of about seven or eight of us that were all there. Gosh, you go back 1980, 81, 82. So a lot of fun, a lot of great friendships. So I was, I was curious, Paul, as I was looking over your LinkedIn page, you've got your interest. One of your interests is the University of Minnesota, which is a long way from LSU. Why Minnesota? Well, I don't know why that's there. I know the PGA just updated my LinkedIn page. I better check that out. I don't know why they have that. Uh, you know, they, they sent me an update and I looked over and missed that. Uh, I'm not too crazy about the Minnesota Vikings when they're playing LSU. That's interesting. But, uh, and of course this year I'm pulling for my Saints pretty hard. I'm a diehard Saints fan, so I'm pulling for my Saints pretty hard this year. So, Paul, skipping ahead but, to your sort of ascension up the ladder at the uh, PGA of America, as I mentioned in your intro, you were secretary, then you became vice president, and ultimately a two-year term as the president. But not only being the president, but being named so during this centennial year had to be a huge compliment for you. Well, it's a, it's a great honor. You know, when you get elected to office, you go through the chairs, two years as secretary, two as vice president, and two as president. And as timing and fate would have it, you know, I was fortunate to be able to do that. Derek Sprague, who was the president before me, uh, served as president for most of that year. And then I went in in November. And, you know, and it was a historic year for us, not just from a standpoint of 100 years, but, you know, you look back and for the PGA of America, we've been trying to grow the game and uh, help people just enjoy this great game for a long time. And as you know, our thousands of golf pros out there in the field, that's what they do every day. They don't. Uh, you know, it's not the most glamorous job some people would think. Uh, you know, you're at a club and you're there early, you're there late, you're teaching golf, you're running golf facilities, you're helping people enjoy the game. A lot of our professionals now are in management and, uh, you know, uh, it's hard to believe that we're now embarking, uh, next year on the 103rd year of the PGA of America. And Paul, I have to imagine that you've gotten to do some pretty cool things. What are some of those things you look back on and think, you know what, that was pretty cool? You know, we, as an officer, you get to do a lot of great, neat things, things you'd never dream of, like being a part of the official Ryder Cup party, which I've been able to do three times. And and when we created the Ryder Cup Task Force, I was a member of that task force. Very neat. 
uh, you know, handing out the PGA Championship trophy at PGA Championships. And those are all things that you'll remember the rest of your life. But the, the most rewarding thing for me was being able to make a difference in the lives of our golf professionals. And, you know, you look at the PGA of America, we're kind of a dual, how do I put it, dual parts of our association. We've got, we run championships. We run two of the five biggest championships in the world, the PGA Championship and the Ryder Cup. We also run the KPMG Women's uh, PGA Championship and the uh, KitchenAid Senior PGA Championship. Uh, not to mention our national championships for our club professionals and, of course, the Ryder Cup. But other than that, we also are an association, and our mission is to grow the game and serve our members. And so how do we take those resources and how do we take the assets we have that I just talked about, major championship golf, and how do we use those to, to grow the game and benefit our members? And uh, For me, that's been the most rewarding thing, I think, is the initiatives that we've been able to forge ahead on in the last two years. and growing the game in education uh, and employment opportunities for our professionals and helping them improve their employment, uh, helping our PGA professionals uh, know how to state their value better to their employers so they can be better compensated. Uh, and then also today, I don't know if you saw the announcement, but uh, the PGA of America announced today something we've been working on for almost two years, uh, probably something I'll look back and We'll look back and say, wow, that was maybe the most uh, significant thing we did. We are going to be relocating the headquarters of the PGA to Frisco, Texas. The press releases just went out today, and uh, we're really excited about that. So talk about that. First of all, what led to, the, to moving it, period, and then why Frisco, Texas? You know, it was just a great opportunity that we had um, about two, gosh, three years ago, our board, we we asked the staff to do an analysis of what cities out there, what uh, areas of the country might be interested in having the PGA, and basically did RFPs and had uh, a major corporation that specializes in this type of business help us uh, analyze the RFPs we had. And as we came down to it, uh, we had several opportunities, but the opportunity in Frisco or staying in West Palm Beach seemed to be the, the top two choices, and the city of Frisco uh, is a very unique area. I don't know how well you know it, but, uh, you look at Frisco, Texas, it's, uh, they've got almost every major sports franchise. It's a, a gateway to the northern part of Dallas. Uh, you know, you've got the Dallas Star right there, which is, uh, an unbelievable, uh, complex. You also have the, um, opportunity we're going to have to build two championship golf courses and, host future Ryder Cup or PG and PGA Championships, not to mention KPMG Women's PGA Championships and also uh, Senior, uh, KitchenAid Senior PGA Championships. So uh, we just think it's a great opportunity. Uh, it's a growing environment. There are many Fortune 500 companies that have moved to the Frisco area, but more importantly, we had a, a, a city, uh, an area, uh, some developers that really wanted to partner with us who's um, their goals and what they believe in, what they think is important, really match uh, what we do. So that was really the, the key to it. You know, we have a lot of side benefits in that our education center, our world-class education center will be there and will now be in the center part of the country, featuring state-of-the-art classrooms and teaching facilities. But uh, when you put it all together, we think it's a great opportunity for the PGA, and we're really excited about it. And Paul, we talked a moment ago about, you know, some of the cool things that you've gotten a, an opportunity to do. What's the opposite side of that coin as president of the PGA that you had to do that you say, you know what, I don't remember reading that in the job description. You know, there's a lot of things that we deal with as a officer and board of directors, but that's like life. You know, I think, uh, you know, what's the old saying? Uh, life is what 97% about what you do with what comes your way. You don't always control what you deal with. And, uh, you know, we always try to focus on what's best for our members and what's best for the game and how do we make those tough decisions to, to, to benefit our mission. Our mission is very simple. Grow the game and enhance opportunity for our members. And that's what we always focused on. Paul, uh, you know, I have to believe that a small part of like you just mentioned a moment ago, when you're talking about putting together the PGA championship and the senior PGA and the LPGA, is, uh, you know, evaluating potential sites. You mentioned the opportunity perhaps to do it there in Frisco at some point. But when you're looking at different venues, what are you looking at or what are you looking for to decide which ones get awarded the events in which year? Well, you know, first of all, 
we have someone named Kerry Haig, who's our chief championship officer. I'm sure you've heard of Kerry. He's been yep. with us since uh, the early 90s, and I think is easily seen as uh, the most talented in what he does in the game of golf. You know, uh, Kerry puts on our major championships, and he scouts out locations. Uh, obviously, you have opportunities where facilities, clubs will come knocking on our door, asking if we're interested. You know, and Kerry goes out in the field and makes sure, you know, today you got to look at the footprint of a facility. You look at a place like Hazeltine, where the Ryder Cup was in 2016, and we announced that we're going to be going back to Hazeltine, as you know, uh, later part of the next right. decade, in the late 20s. I think it's uh, 28 we're going back. But the point being, the reason that Hazeltine was so good, it had such a big footprint for all the hospitality, for all of the corporate tents and the corporate sponsors. So that's all part of it that fits into where a facility should be. Also, we look for, first of all, we look for a great golf course. If you look at the PGA Championship golf courses that we've selected for the last 10 or 15 years, and you go out in the future, we have some PGAs that are selected all the way into the early 30s. They're great golf courses, iconic golf courses, Oak Hill Country Club in New York, the Olympic Club we got to announce. I was able to do that under my presidency that we're going through the Olympic Club for a Ryder Cup and the PGA Championship. Uh, you know, you look at Aronomic, um, you know, you look at Quail Hollow where it was last year. These are great golf facilities with great communities and strong leadership in those towns and at those clubs to help us put on one of the, you know, most exciting, best, uh, largest championships in the world, the PGA Championship. And, Paul, as you look out into 2019 and even further into the future, what are some of the issues that you still think are facing the PGA and the other governing bodies that uh, we still need to get some work on and need to address? Well, the main thing we need to do is we got to grow the game. That's the number one charge, I think, for us, and that's the thing that we're focused on. We are looking to make sure that we continue to provide the resources for our professionals. We've got to think out of the box. I mean, you look at the Top Golf. What an unbelievable story. I can remember running for office in 2010. Top Golf was just getting started. Uh, you know, you look today, they're a company that has grown the game in a very unusual way. I mean, 18 million visitors to Top Golf last year. Anytime someone puts a golf club in their hand, it's a good thing. I was at a Top Golf actually in Las Vegas two days ago with my wife and some friends, and it's 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 a it's a different crowd. So how do we grow the game? How do we make it more fun? I think that's the key buzzword. How do we engage the public more? How do we connect with our consumers? Those are all important things. Paul, just a couple more before we let you go and talk about the decision to move the PGA Championship back from August to May. Are you excited to see it getting played earlier in the year and then obviously being at Beth Page, Beth Page Black this coming year? Well, first of all, being at Beth Page Black, what a great golf course with a unbelievable history of championship golf. Um, we're very excited. That was a decision that really we studied for over three years before we made the announcement in August of 16 at Quail Hollow. Uh, Pete Bavakwa, who was our CEO at that time for about six years, uh, he and his team brought to the board of directors on several occasions studies that looked at what golf courses we could still go to, uh, how would it affect TV ratings, uh, what the viability would be of moving it, how it would relate to the rest of the world. And even though there were a lot of articles written at the time tying it to the PGA Tour wanting to move the playoffs, the FedEx playoffs, up early to avoid the football season, we we were charged to do what's in the best interest of the PGA of America and our 29,000 members who own the PGA. And you know, one of the real exciting parts of it is we get to promote what our professionals do every day much earlier in the season. Now, I, I live in an area where the season is November to May, kind of like South Florida. But 85 or 90% of the country, we know the golf season is April, May to October. So with all of the television coverage, uh, the chance to have announcements on behalf of our professionals, we get to advertise all of that, promote all of that in May instead of August. We think that's going to be a big difference maker. Well, Paul, before we let you go, now your alma mater and mine are squaring off in the Fiesta Bowl on New Year's Day, LSU and UCF. What are you expecting out of the game? Well, you know, that's going to be a great game. I think UCF has not gotten the respect it should get the last few years. If you remember last year, they did pretty good in the bowl game. And and I've already, yeah. like any good fan, have, have uh, gone on the web and 
look at what everyone's saying about UCF and LSU, and a lot of people are picking LSU, I would not take that school lightly. I mean, for a team that is, what are they, undefeated the last 20? Four games, twenty-five games. That's, yeah, that's I don't correct. Care who you play? That's an amazing. That's an amazing statistic. It was a disappointing year for my Tigers. I think the most disappointing loss was I was sitting at my house. Uh, my granddaughters were over with my wife, and I was outside so I could smoke a nice little cigar and watch LSU lose in seven overtimes to A and M. That was a pretty, <laughs> uh, pretty interesting game. If you saw it, it lasted five hours. Yes. We had a few we had a few calls that Coach O didn't didn't complain about, but it was an interesting outcome. Right, agreed. So, Paul, let our listeners know how what's the best way to stay up to date with what you're doing and what the PGA of America is doing, whether it's online or it's on social media. Well, I think the best thing with the PGA of America always, you know, uh, if you go to PGA dot com, you can see a lot of what's going on in the PGA of America. Also, we have a Twitter page, and I'd be remiss to tell you exactly what that is, but if you Google it, you can find it pretty easy. Our president, Susie Whaley, you know, we have a new president as of four weeks ago, and she's unbelievable. I know you've heard of Susie, and yes. uh, she's going to be a great PGA president, really strong in promoting the game, you know, really uh, fits in well with where we're trying to go with this association. And if you look at uh, what we're doing in the junior golf space, and I think Susie's really focused on how can we revamp some of the resources we've had for our teachers and coaches because we need more of our professionals out there teaching the game and growing the game every day. And that's really at the core of what a PGA professional is. You know, there's a lot of people that work at a golf course or country club, and you look at a lot of our professionals today have moved into management. Some are executives with the big company. But the core of who the PGA professional is, there's someone who plays the game at a very high level, It teaches the game and are very passionate about both. Well, Paul, thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to come and be a part of the show. I hope you'll do it again sometime. So many other things I'd love to get into with you. Just not enough time, but uh, you're a wealth of knowledge and uh, great for the game of golf. And thank you for your service to the PGA of America for so many years. But uh, thank you for your time again tonight. Well, thank you for what you're doing to be part of growing this great game and just uh, being out there for the listeners. I appreciate that. Paul, take care. Happy holidays to you and your family. We look forward to the opportunity, hopefully, to catch up with you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. That is Paul Levy. And Paul is, uh, like I say, you know, you go back and you look at his time in the game of golf from playing it at, at LSU to his ascension up through the golf ranks to secretary of the PGA of America to vice president to president, now honorary president going forward. Great for the game of golf. He's done a lot of really great things, and hopefully we get the opportunity to talk more about the direction and where the PGA of America is going, and then a little bit more about the rich history of the game as well. All right, folks, time for me to put a bow on this episode of Next on the Tee. I want to send out my sincere thanks again to Natalie Sherry and Paul Levy for joining me tonight, and thank you for tuning in and listening. We appreciate you guys the very most. Please give me your thoughts. Check out our page on Facebook, Next on the Tee with Chris Mascaro, and right there you can give me your comments and your feedback or like I say, if you have a question you want you know, us to get to someone who's been a previous guest or a future guest coming on the show, please let us know right there as well. You can check out our guest schedule by going online to our, our uh, webpage is nextonthetea.net. Please also check out our sister show on the football side, Thursday Night Tailgate, with me and my co-host Bob Lazari and our announcer Joe Lajanusa. That show airs live right here on Blog Talk Radio every Thursday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. And that show like this one also available as a featured free podcast over on iHeartRadio and on Podbean. On Thursday Night Tailgate, we're joined every week by five NFL legends who come on and share stories from their playing days and give us their insights into what's going on around the league. Spotlight on the positive segment. That show you can find out more information online at ThursdayNightTailgate.com. And again, this show, NextOnTheT.net. Folks, thank you again for choosing to listen to the show tonight. We really appreciate the fact that you are making Next on the Tee part of your golf content. Until next week, hit them straight, my friends. You've been listening to Next on the Tee with Chris Mascaro, where PGA and LPGA pros and top instructors and media members go to tell their stories. Join us the same time every Tuesday to hear more stories about the game we love from people who love sharing those stories with you. It's all about the great game of golf.
It's all about 